Okay, so for our last talk today, uh, I'm happy to welcome Andreas Antoniades, uh, who's the Managing Director of Obelisk Systems, uh, an Australian embedded aerospace and electrical engineering firm located in the Hunter Valley. Um, and he's here as uh, Obelisk Systems is dedicated to providing hardware platforms that not only facilitate easier access to space, but also address the growing need for STEM education. Uh, recently, Obelisk Systems has engaged in several educational hardware projects, one of which is powering the first Australian startup mission to the ISS. Thank you, Ed. Awesome. Andres. <laughs> right. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so my talk today is called Designing Hardware APIs to Facilitate Hands-On Learning. However, I think a better title for it is probably Making Hardware Cool for Kids, The Story of a Space Startup, because it's a little bit more casual than what the original title was you know, supposed to be. Um, so yeah, and also thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, it's, it's awesome to be able to come and be part of such a fantastic community of programmers and teachers and yeah, just to do our thing. So um, firstly, regarding the whole internet's thing, if you want to like follow us and what we're up to, these are normal stuff. I'm on the PyCon Slack as well as Andreas. Um, and yeah, as we said, um, my company is Obelisk Systems. We're about six or seven months old, and we've done some pretty, pretty awesome stuff so far with some satellite gear and some education hardware. Um, I'll get into that real soon. Um, a bit of a summary of who we are. We're a Novocastrian aerospace company. It's weird saying that because I wouldn't have thought that was possible a couple of years ago. Um, we're a bunch of University of Newcastle graduates. Uh, we build and design satellite components, uh, university equipment, diagnostic and learning tools, um, educational hardware systems, which I'll talk about as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, as, as we said, we, we're people who send stuff in a space. It's, it's what we're about, what we love doing. Um, who is the team? Who are we? Well, it's myself, Luke, Levi, and Lewis. Uh, Lewis is also here today, so he's going to probably try and answer like a couple of questions that I can't, if possible. Right, so that's us. Why are we doing what we're doing? What's our jam? Well, like, I think when it comes to satellite technology, it's all about, oh, for us, it's all about cost reduction. So typically your satellite systems today are really, really expensive. So we're going really cheap, miniature satellites. Uh, CubeSats, I don't know, anyone heard of CubeSats before? Tiny little ones, they're about this big. Actually, they're exactly that big. <laughs> so, um, and uh, yeah, we're all about making those really, really affordable to help facilitate getting people into space, doing science, experimentation, and also having them so cheap that you can put them into universities and schools and actually have schools playing with aerospace hardware and programming little miniature satellites. Um, as part of that, we really want to help improve technologies. We're not just making it affordable by skimping out on what's in the thing. We're going for cutting edge stuff. Um, and by doing that, we really want to help you know, get technology as a whole progressed. Um, because when you do that, you, you typically see a lot of really cool things coming back from the aerospace programs. And I'll talk a bit more about it in a little while. Um, and of course, education. It's a huge part of what we do. Um, I founded the company on the foundation of an affordable, affordable satellite platform that could be used in universities and schools around the world to teach space science. Uh, and it was my honest thesis. Um, but yeah, I'll talk more about, as, yeah, about that in a sec. So, where did it begin? Well, it began with a project called the Protosat, and that was my crazy, crazy idea. Um, I thought, okay, let's make a um, let's make a CubeSat for under a thousand dollars, and is it possible to be done? Um, I didn't want university students to be purchasing a hundred to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars worth of satellite hardware only for one university student to say, "What does this do?" and blow it up, because that happens a lot. Happens a lot, like when you see like kids with Arduinos, kids with other Raspberry Pis, like you, you're going to poke at it, and it, the blue magic smoke once it comes out of a chip, you can't put it back in again. And we know that's what makes chips work, right? So, anyway, uh, and I was a bit rebellious. I was like, well, if these guys doing it for hundred k, I think I can uh, beat them. And so, <laughs> I got about halfway through the satellite design. I actually came up with. Um, power supply and telecommunications modules. And I thought, hey, actually, let's transform this into a bit of a venture. Let's actually make this into a company because I think this has got some p potential. Um, so uh, this is some of the stuff that we've made, just as a bit of a background. So power supply for a miniature satellite, telecommunications platform, 
Now, this is an onboard computer. Onboard computer itself is actually just come back from prototyping yesterday. So we're going to be fiddling with that and hopefully no blue smoke from that either. Um, and the cool thing is about it, about this is it's probably about 30 to 40 times more powerful um, as something about this big than the atmospherics uh, processes that currently exist on the International Space Station. And it's, you know, for a development version, next to no, next to no money at all. So um, what do they look like? Little satellites, they look like this. Well, again, exactly this size. So if you can picture this, um, they come in multiple, ver uh, multiple uh, versions. So you've got one U, which is 10 by 10 by 10, and then you can have two U, three U, six U, nine U, whatever. There's many different combinations. Um, and what often happens is they get sent to the International Space Station, and then there's this shotgun mechanism, and it just goes, just fires them out. And they fly off and they do science. Yeah, it's just a, it's a big, yeah, it's a big spring-loaded mechanism, and they just get shot out at high speed. Um, and then these things power up, deploy their antennas, and do all sorts of really fantastic science for, like I said, a very, very small amount of money versus the big stuff that NASA and ESA and SpaceX are spending, uh, you know, sending up there, like your big commercial satellites that are multiple billions of dollars. Uh, anyway, so they do it, they burn up, no problem, happy, happy. Why do we do what we do at Obelisk Systems? Well, simply put, we do it for a better tomorrow. And that is, yeah, again, why we focus so much on the education aspects. Um, if we can make this stuff available to everyone, um, it means we can move forward technologically. Like when it comes to the, uh, a lot of the advanced uh, consumer technologies that uh, you're using today in this room, a lot of them actually came from a lot of your um, uh, space program missions, uh, GPS. Uh, your mobile phone communications, te television, uh, advanced refrigeration systems, um, mattresses. Um, like, there's a lot of things like that that, have, that we have to thank to the space program. And the more people that get involved with the space program and, and space exploration, a lot more funnels back down to us as a people. And it, it just makes life easier for everyone. Um, and also, one of the big ones is, uh, it's our only ch doing space things is really our only chance of survival. Like we need an insurance policy, and that's not to be here anymore on Earth, but to kind of go other places too. Anyway, so we've got CubeSat hardware, and we really wanted to program these things, uh, and we really wanted to, you know, make them like from a software perspective, not crippling the potential within a classroom or a university. Um, we just wanted people to get in there and just get science done because that's what it's all about. Just finding out about how the world works, how space works. So we thought to ourselves, right, we need a programming language that um, we can interrogate the system as fast as possible. Um, and like, sure, uh, embedded C, which is typically used, is always going to be king. But interpreting that in a fast way, you know, would be fantastic, and, but we, we didn't really want to do that because it's really complicated. And the thing is, if we're going to have this gear in universities and schools, it's got to be pretty simple out of the box. So naturally, what was the answer? Yeah, did, uh, yeah, it was Python. It was Python. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and yeah, of course, that's why I'm here to talk to you today. So, why did we choose Python um, as something to use within satellite hardware? I mean, that's a pretty crazy concept, right? Well, the thing is, is that as it turns out, it's got very, very simple syntax. It's relatively great at interfacing with hardware, and it's stable without slowing down too much. And for scientists and engineers, that's fantastic. Um, People typically think that embedded C is like the king, like you can't beat it, you know, but that's not, not, not the case. I mean, we've seen with, um, with MicroPython even today <laughs> um, that you can do some pretty phenomenal things. And um, the thing is, is that our microcontrollers are able to do these things with Python. Um, Second thing, oh sorry, third thing, it's a top five programming language. That's huge. Um, familiarity around the world and adoption uh, is really, really important for people just getting in there and, and, and playing with it. Um, and honestly, if you have a question with Python, you just go to Google. And there's 99% of the time there's an answer for you know, the problem that you're having, which is great. Um, you can't do that with a few, other, a few other languages and your embedded programming languages are typically a little bit more challenging. And also, it's highly STEM applicable. Like education uh, packages and libraries exist straight out of the bo you know, box to help with maths, graphing, and more. And I think today, as far as this stream goes, I've seen so many different awesome libraries for education that, yeah, I don't even need to mention any. So, yeah. All right. And on that note, 
yes, it works with our satellite hardware, and that was the big king. Um, so the cool thing is we can easily talk to um, these systems from desktops or anything that can run Python, um, and I'll talk more on that real soon. Okay, so moving on, this is what the cool stuff is about. We had an idea. We did all this, and we're like, right, okay, so how about if kids could run code in space? And you've probably heard about this concept before, um, and it's, it's something that's going to happen real soon. But, I mean, the thing is, we're an aerospace company making some serious gear. Let's make some more gear to facilitate learning. So, you know, we've got to make this hardware to help run Python uh, actually a CubeSat component. We want to make it something that actually clips onto a satellite, a real functioning satellite. Uh, it lets kids in classrooms play with real satellite hardware. Um, and then um, it's got a load, of, a load of sensors on it that they can actually do scientific experiments with. And they can do it in a classroom and then translate that into orbit or into a space station. So they learn how to program and how to talk to these sensors. Um, they come up with a hypothesis. They test that hypothesis by running code. That's the thing. And then the idea was you'd have a master unit that gets blasted to space and runs. And that is where we went from that. So we started developing the hardware. And eventually we ended up with something that we called the, the Asimov Create for Space Kit. So we pioneered that hardware. I'm guessing some of you have probably heard of it, uh, heard of it before. Um, it's a universal invention programming platform powered by Raspberry Pi. Um, we like the Raspberry Pi because it's a self-contained system. Um, it's like a turbocharged BBC Micro or Sense Hat for Raspberry Pi. So far we're in 50 plus schools uh, and sold 60 plus kits, which is great. Uh, and that's just the beginning. Um, just to give you a bit of a background and sort of sensing that you can do, you've got accelerometers for your acceleration, magnetometer, magnetic fields, compasses, gyroscope for your um, angular velocity, uh, temperatures, self-explanatory, camera, again, self-explanatory. You can detect infrared light, ambient light in different colors, which is really cool, ultraviolet light for, you know, seeing whether it's dangerous to go outside if the sun's going to be really crazy on day or something, and uh, pressure and moisture, which is also really handy. Um, this is how it's set up. It's just plugged in, uh, and that's Lewis, my hand model. Uh, so it says keyboard, mouse, flash stick if you want, power, HDMI cable, and you're away to go. You just go straight to the desktop interface. This here is the master unit that we designed, which is space rated. So this thing takes all the students' experiments, collaborate, uh, smooshes them all together, and runs them sequentially in space. Now, OK, that's sweet. We've come up with this concept, we've got kits in schools, what now? Well, as we heard in the introduction, what's really, really cool is that we're powering the first All-Australian payload to the International Space Station with these school experiments on board. So this thing is on its way to the space station in November. Um, and uh, yeah, it's something that we're pretty proud of. Um, but what I'm most proud of above everything is that everything that we've done, all the assembly, uh, all, the, um, all the manufacturing of like the, the units themselves, the programming, the art, design, everything, it's all done here ooh, in Australia. Like, and that's something that you don't typically see with your hardware. Um, so, right. Let's talk about Python because that's what we're here for. <laughs> What makes STEM exciting for kids? Um, the thing is, is that like we need more kids in STEM. How kids like eventually will be able to feed back into like our economies uh, and help our planet is is really vital to to making STEM important and relevant. Um, so how do we inspire them? Well, when it comes to your programming and your experimentation, you really got to see it in action. So as we've heard many times before, your textbook education um, and following distinct methods is, you know, like a bit boring. Uh, you want to untether them. You kind of want to give them problems instead and just let them figure it out. But at the same time, students these days, they have massive schedules. Um, so like you've got to make sure that it's relevant so they can just be clipped into your existing curriculum um, and they can just use it as a tool for everyday stuff. Just an you know, off the shelf sort of thing that can be in a science uh, environment. Um, you don't want to tear them away with like the next big thing. You just got to keep it really relative, uh, relevant to, to what's going on. And you also got to let them be creative. And I'll add to that later. So the problem is that sure we've got this really great you know tool, um, but uh, low level programming of sensors is crazy. Like you, you're going to spend hours and hours 
uh, actually, you know, programming to gain access to these sensors, a lot of the time they're proprietary. Uh, it's not easy, a lot of kids don't want to do it. Um, and the thing is, is that if you've got such an awesome out of the box programming environment, you don't want to stop people like from actually using it. So from the student engagement perspective, the thing is that kids aren't interested in writing sensor interface code, like I said. There's little time in the curriculum, like I said, <laughs> and uh, in order to improve the student experience, we needed to do something about it. Now, just as an example of what we're talking about, this is a standard library that is necessary to get a single accelerometer working straight out of the box. And the thing is, is that kids don't want to program something this long just to get an X, Y, or Z value. I know I don't. So, <laughs> but the thing is, we had to do something about it. So our solution was to actually make a uh, hardware API for students that is applicable for both the hardware uh, for the uh, for the high school and university level. So an application programming interface API, they, they exist to make our lives easier. And in the case of education, we want to make it easy for kids to be able to write just a few fundamental lines of code um, and get instant gratification. Because that's, that's the thing, like if they don't see results straight away, they're gonna get bored with the thing. Um, and the thing is, is that, you know, if you're gonna be losing hours and hours to a single sensor to get a single value, then they're not gonna, they're just gonna ditch it. Uh, especially, and the thing is, is that normal out of the box programming, like if you're gonna be doing addition or print statements and things like that, it doesn't put you into the real world. And that's what we kind of wanted to do because if it's relevant, then they'll learn. So a trick, um, one little bit of a disclaimer, you can't use the, uh, this API that we've been like trying to work towards with that basic programming skill. Like, I, I put this in here because, like, you do kind of need to know your very basic stuff, like your loops and things. And um, to that I say, there's a lot of talent out there that teaches it. Grok Learning is probably the one that I love the most. It's just, you go there, you do a few courses, and you'll be able to use this API out of the box. Um, there's not much you need to do, which is what we're trying to, yeah, to get at. All right, so. Then you give them a universal, then you give you know, the students a universal device to let them explore the physical world. I'm talking, of course, about the Asimov kit. Um, and the thing is, is that like, you really want, um, like the hardware is only ever going to be as good as the software. So the reality is that a device like this, it could be a brand new set of eyes um, for a student and it helps them see the world in ways that they've never seen before. Um, and there's endless experiments to be done in classrooms today um, that don't really, you know, put things into perspective. Um, and like I said earlier, that instant feedback, instant gratification of what's happening in the real world is really, really important. If it takes forever to get to it, you're not going to learn it. This is two happy kids, me and Lewis, enjoying the API. <laughs> it gets us outside and I can tell you now, like I said, we really didn't want to deal with a 20 page um, API to do basic testing of our own space grade hardware because often we want to test sensors and we just want to be able to just dive into an API that gets things done. Um, here's a real life application, a balloon flight. So this cube here was actually flown to the stratosphere last week. Um, we launched it from tomorrow. We wanted to test the power of the API. Um, so what we did was we loaded it into a weather balloon and a young intern was tasked with using the bare bones API in such a way that students would, you know, basically gain a, use the, the most fundamental level of Python um, and use the API to actually solve a problem. Problem being, they wanted to actually see um, the rapid changes in humidity and tell the user what altitude that you know, event occurred. Um, and it could be done with a few handfuls of lines. So these are some photos, of course, of the balloon launch. And this is some of the data that the API pulled, very simply, we're talking four or five lines. And of course, they were able to apply um, their math and uh, detect uh, and log to a file exactly when um, that, uh, that those events happened, those humidity changes happened. Um, one thing that we're doing with our API is because it exists self-sustained, we're trying to crank up um, how fast we can log data because logging data is really uh, quickly is the key to getting really smooth plots and not having like janky lines everywhere. So we're at the moment at 25 hertz uh, and you can push it up to 400 hertz, which means that you can get a lot of data and you can do really, really 
interesting things with it um, without like a lot of distortion. So how does it work? Because I'm kind of like waffling here. Right, really simply put, what we're calling it is the obelisk abstraction engine. So we have this hardware engine that sits in the middle of your Python script, which can just be run from your standard IDE, and the hardware. It does all the serious number crunching, the data translation from your sensors, and we've optimized it as a binary system that runs by itself. Um, there's a lot of work that's gone into it to making sure that it gets data as fast as possible from the sensors um, so that you can push the system. Um, and uh, we're trying to make it compatible with a huge amount of sensors so it can just be a plug and play thing for heaps of different you know, hardware applications. Um, and from here, you just have a really, really simple library uh, Python file. You just import it. Uh, and you make function calls from within your program. It connects to the engine, and the magic happens without blue smoke. Um, right, so we've made it really, really simple so students can use it in classrooms. You just implement it in this sense. The device that you're trying to use, the sensor that you're trying to pull data from, and then you interrogate it and you ask it specifically for that type of information. This is an example uh, of actually how to use it within a classroom application. So say that you want to get gyroscopic data. All you do is you tell it the device name within your Python script, you tell it what sensor you're after, and then the data that you want. Then that feeds back into the abstraction engine and it does everything it can to make sure that you get that data as fast as possible instantly. Here's another one that we use all the time for our, uh, for our satellite stuff. EPS, electrical power system. We want to find out about current. We talk to the current sensor, specifically current sensor number one, and then we ask it for the current, and as fast as it can, our system running in the background, on the microcontroller even, will interrogate that sensor and return it. And this is how to implement it and actually get temperature straight away. And this is getting it from an onboard computer. You import the Obelisk engine, you connect to it, and you just you can dump the information straight to a variable. And that's really, really cool because it can be used in a, it's a completely self-sustained system, and we've made sure that the speed of the sensors is, uh, you know, as as succinct as possible. Like, can you imagine if kids were programming each sensor? Like the differences in speed that you'd get for different hardware platforms, it would just it'd be a nightmare. Um, and it's flexible. We can actually use it with a whole bunch of language with other languages too. We're talking like we can use it with Scratch if you want to. So if kids, young kids, want to get sensor data really easy. We can port it to heaps. Dare I say we port it to Java as well. I don't know. We can do all sorts of stuff. Anyway, so yeah, you end up with relevant and fun data. It's live and simple. You've got real science, uh, real programming, and you meet learning outcomes because you can just get straight into just using it as an extension to your existing learning tools. Um, it's going to be really, really accurate, um, and you can use it in games as well. So. Um, because it's live, uh, you get that instant gratification when you use it in a game environment. An opportunity I can probably use is you can use it as a like you can use it as like a Python Tamagotchi like digital pet code where you need to take it outside into the sun for it to survive or something like that. You know, like you can do all sorts of fun stuff, and that encourages that creativity aspect because it's now so simple to talk to the real world. Um, and I think. Basically, we've known for, yeah, this is my last slide. Um, so we've known for a long time that science uh, teaching is really only successful through practicals, right? Like, no matter what you do, if you give a kid a textbook, they're not just going to learn everything, like even close to what they would if you did your practical experiments. So the thing is, is that with your technology, engineering, and math aspects of STEM, they're integral to the big picture, right? Um, but we're still struggling to actually give them like practical like relevancy in the classroom. Um, and you've got to take inspiration from, from what works. And the thing is, because kids have traditionally loved like hands-on science experiments, we've tried to give a code base and an engine that will let that science practical sense be used with your maths and, and your programming as well. So um, what that means is, yeah, having the easily programmable hardware now it allows you to realize the same, con uh, you know, same concept uh, in the technology, engineering, math fields. Um, and I just looped over again. <laughs> um, and the thing is, is that it will help them, at the end of the day, just get a wider range of skills to solve problems. And thanks.
And you can scan that to take you straight to our website. <laughs> Thank you, Andreas. Uh, we have any questions? This is fantastic. We've been um, struggling with the launch of a high altitude balloon for the last sort of nine months and plan to launch later this year. Mm. We've got two competing and conflicting goals though. The first is the actual programming of a system to, to make use mm. of that data and do something interesting with it. But alongside that we have a mechatronics class who the whole point is to sort of build and operate really low level to, to, to work yeah. off the, reading the data from registers and things like that at the yeah. hardware. So how would something like this allow us to potentially do both of those things so that we can hit our goals in IT and the mechatronics guys can still give students that exposure to the low level stuff? Well, the thing is you don't actually, like we don't rob you of the low level stuff at all. See, the thing is, is that I feel like this is more of a, this is more of a tool to get people to not be discouraged at the very beginning. So the thing is that your mechatronic students can still dive in and use those sensors directly. We don't block them or anything. The inter yeah, the interface engine just sits there and talks to it and just facilitates a really quick data read. So I think what it comes down to is we do a balloon launch and actually getting data and stuff like that. You could have this abstraction engine running nonstop on, say, a Raspberry Pi, like this where the balloon system runs off a Raspberry Pi. Um, and at the same time, you could have other experiments that are running on your mechatronics, which try to potentially um, interrogate the sensors in different ways, see if they can get more out of them, sort of like an optimization sort of thing. Uh, would that perhaps yeah, no, work? That, that sounds really cool. I'll, I'll be talking to you guys a little bit more over the next couple of days. Well, it's just here tonight, so yeah. Um, yeah, hi, I've sort of got two questions. First of all, cost. What are we talking about if a school wanted to... Um, for the software engine or the hardware? The, the hardware, well, probably. For the hardware, that was an old project. Um, okay. And that was $1,100 that included the flight to space. Now, we don't ah. know anymore because we're not the, we weren't the ones that were directly selling it. We were on selling it to another provider. So, um, yeah, like I'm not too sure. So it is, it is pricey from a, the perspective of just a raw hardware platform, right? But yeah, the idea was is that that cost actually incorporated funding a rocket launch, which are hundreds of thousands of dollars, you know? So, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah. So, okay, so, but you were talking about um, so, some of these are going up on the ISS. Just one, one master unit. Just one is going up. Yeah. So, in terms of getting students to uh, get, you know, their code experiments mm. happening in, space yep. is that an option yeah yeah that's the, that's the idea the idea was that um, the uh, schools would develop on their own platform so they get the kit and they'd play around and understand how it works and they'd, they'd start programming it and then they'd come up with their own little self-contained code block and that would be sent in and it would be integrated into like a one big stack of experiments and they'd run one after the other so they, yeah the schools get the opportunity to run their own experiments in space yeah Great. Okay, so when you say they need to get a kit, yes, that's the Asimov. Yes, yeah. The, thing. The, okay, the, the so box what's the it. cost of that? Oh, uh, it was bundled with the flight cost, like I said. So it was just an eleven hundred. That was that was what it was originally going for. So yeah, that included the hardware and the and the mission. It was like a all in one sort of thing. Yeah. Right. So I'm still not sure if is there's an opportunity for students to just to buy the hardware. Do this now. Um, not through us. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, that's actually Cube Rider that yes. was doing the thing. Uh, uh, and so, yeah. yeah. So we're the hardware dudes. Yeah. And uh, we, yeah, so we, we worked on all the hardware platforms. And then basically, Cube Rider took over from there and did all the distribution to schools. So, like I said, originally, cost was 1100 We don't know what the retail price is now, but it incorporates everything. Yeah. yeah. So that would kind of feed into my question whether, like, if people wanted to use this for, uh, weather balloon type experiments? I would like to. Um, I would say stay tuned. Um, we like uh, the, the hardware API has really shown us um, fantastic ways to get people more involved in actually doing like the experimentation and, and getting into, into your code far better and, and we've heard a lot that the hardware platform itself should be just something that's available as a general 
hard, like similar to an Arduino. So yeah, like that's definitely something future potentially, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, um, I see that your customer or your um, target is an um, educational system and probably high school at uh, mm -hmm. year 12. Yeah. And students um, from probably year one to the final year. Um, I see that there's uh, three sensors there with accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. Mm -hmm. Um, what are they for for the educational purpose or it just oh yeah absolutely yeah so um, the, the so the the nine axis IMU which has the accelerometer magnetometer gyroscope um, they can use those um, in all sorts of practical applications and like being able to read them directly um, in this regard it means you can write a simple program like uh, like similar to um, like a little ball maze and the accelerometer will help you guide the ball through the maze and the magnetometer, you could use it in a classroom uh, using uh, graphing libraries that we've seen talked about earlier today um, to make like a compass, uh, for example, that's based off the magnetic readings that you that you read around. And then um, your um, gyroscope is you know, see how violently you're tilting the device and, and get feedback on that. So you can do all that like within um, within a classroom. I can think of the accelerometer uh, as far as like a scientific experiment goes. You could definitely use it as a Newton meter or something as well. Um, that's got its applications there. So yeah, it can be relevant. I, I'd say like the the target market was from years nine to ten. Mm. So yeah. And um, I see that there's a kind of communication link there for USB. And do you have wireless on wireless. the board? Um, the system doesn't have wireless. Yeah, that would be great. That would be good. Next version probably. <laughs> okay. Yep. Okay, if there's no more questions, uh, we'll wrap yeah. that up there. Thank okay. you very much, Andres. Yeah. We're working on some pretty awesome stuff as well. Before, yeah, just before. So we're working on some new stuff as well as part of this API. There's a lot more hardware and stuff that we're getting involved in because the space stuff is cool, but we feel that STEM is even cooler. So yeah, just keep your eyes peeled for other really, really cool stuff with regards to you know the getting more involved with your hardware in classrooms and universities. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much.